Sara, you were enthusiastic about pattern and geometry in maths as a child, but it was an art teacher, I believe, that gave you a book that really opened your eyes to Islamic art. Yeah, um, so I, I grew up in the north of England, northwest, and my favourite subject was always art. I loved art. And I've always enjoyed drawing grids and drawing, maybe it's kind of my nature, but symmetrical formations or trying to understand um, numbers and how they relate to each other. And the school that I went to had a purpose-built art room, so it was beautiful. There was massive, huge windows and you could sit in there and I was the only Asian girl in the school. So it was quite an unusual upbringing, you know, in kind of Cheshire, there wasn't many people like me. And so the art room was a sanctuary and I had a very, very good art teacher, an inspirational art teacher from the age of 12. And I had the same art teacher all the way through to the age of 18. And then one day he gave me a book on um, specifically the Moroccan geometry, Moroccan art. And it was just like, wow, this, is amazing this is just wow and and then after that I got the Bourgain book which is the plates you know it's quite a famous book historical you know and so I started looking at those but at school I didn't have the sophistication or the kind of ability to be able to draw the patterns I was still I was using rulers I was using protractors and I was using measurements but the brilliance of my art teacher was he just let me get on with it I was quite productive. I was quite good. I was a good student. You yeah. ended up studying English, English and history. history. Which was great, yeah. actually. It was a really... You know, I, I love books. I love reading. I still love books. I still love reading. I still love history. And when I look back at what could have been... or I have no regrets, actually. I'm not full of woe and... Woe is me. I should, wish I'd done art. Because I've earned, in a roundabout, ended, roundabout way, I've ended up where I wanted to be anyway. You, you were working at the BBC yeah. when you discovered um, that there was a particular course that chimed with your yeah. interests. Do you mind telling us yeah. about that? So at the BBC, at the very first I started, and, and this is really funny now, because I graduated in 2001, and back then the internet was new. It was exciting, and the BBC was very excited about internet. And they wanted to expand. I mean, the BBC, one of the first, actually, organisations that had such a comprehensive website with all sorts of information and they were writing all sorts of pages and now they've I think they've reduced it down a bit but then they wanted to have this encyclopedia of information on the web so I was um, I was working for news and current affairs and then I was working for religion and ethics and they asked me to to do some research on Islamic art and because they wanted um, you know some web pages to accompany a season so I'd worked on a season of programmes about Islam and they wanted a website to go along with it. So I was writing articles and then I came across the Prince's School. And I'm like, oh, this is interesting. And I remember seeing the picture that illustrated it. Well, that's the geometry. And they've got it right. <laughs> the drawing is absolutely accurate. And it was something that kind of re, you know, reignited that passion and reignited that thinking in me because I tried so hard to get these patterns and to be able to draw these patterns accurately. And then when I saw it, I thought, wow, there's a place in the world that teaches this. Not and too far away. Well, London. Yeah. For me, it was. It's the other side of the world. From, you know, yeah. um, and so I, um, I applied. And I, di I really didn't think that I would get in. Um, and the interview was based on the portfolio of work and all that I'd done and my drawings. And they, they looked at my drawing and they said, oh, so this is what you've been doing. <laughs> and you've been doing it. And I think they saw the passion and I think they saw the actual the drive and the determination to be able to draw this and, and the trying to understand it. And they said, what you're doing wrong is you're not using a compass. Can you do a compass? It'll get a lot easier. So um, I applied and um, I got a scholarship. Um, I got a full scholarship. So it meant that I could go. Because if I hadn't had that financial backing, I mean, there's, it would have been very difficult to kind of just up sticks and move to London. But it, it was a shock to my system. It really was. Because I, I'd come from a humanities degree at Manchester where there was 12 hours teaching time. And they gave you a book list at the beginning of term. And they said, go away and write two 4,000 word essays and come back, you know, and we'll mark them. And there was a tutorial a week and, a, you know, a, a kind of lecture twice a week and that was it and you were left to your own devices so and going to the princess school it was 
you were there from 10 till 5 every day at your desk working, which is a massive shock. Oh God, you know, this is, this is a discipline. Um, and they were keen on discipline. And there was a, a theoretical framework to the course, which was based on Plato. So the, the first, and all of these lessons have stayed with me. And they, they talked about the platonic understanding of teaching. And Plato says that if you're a good teacher, you're not putting in information, you're not putting in knowledge, you're drawing out. You're drawing out what already exists in that person. And there was this idea that Keith Critchlow, one of the teachers on the course, used to talk about was different people have ability in different things and they have innate ability and the good teacher can see what somebody's good at and then draw that out. So it was a very individual course and it was very, um, very intensive. It was very hard work and there was a tutorial a week. So every week you'd have to show all the work that you'd done and praise wasn't given out much at all. Um, yeah, it, it, it completely changed a lot of the ways that I worked. It was rigorous it, and there was discipline. And, you know, I thought when I started the course that I could paint. I had decided I, I could paint. And then you, you start to learn how to paint. You think, I can't paint at all. Oh, Christmas. But they, they, they go back, back to the very beginning, um, even with painting, going back to pigments. Where do pigments come from? Grinding your own pigments making your own paint, making oil paints, making watercolours, and, and then, you know, the discipline of just painting with one colour, so using yellow ochre and, and painting, you know, copying a landscape or co copying something with tone and depth to make you able to understand tone and depth just with one colour, and then they'd introduce another colour. It was so rigorous and it was so good because it really makes you understand colour, makes you understand chemical colours, earth colours, ochres, you know, how everything fits in together onto the palette. One of the things that they teach you on the course is that the history of the form and the history of the, 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 the way that geometry is. And so they go all the way back to the ancient Greeks, uh, from Plato to Pythagoras, and, and, and the, the way that the ancients discovered the solids, the platonic solids, and how those evolved, 3D geometry, 2D geometry. And <clears throat> it's a very... It's, it's very different to a Western education. In one sense, you're getting an Eastern education based on this spiritual practice in a Western school, which is facilitated by the Prince of Wales, which is, and it embodies his values and, and purpose. And there's some very, very good things on the course. So you're, you're, what they're doing is that it's, it's a college for the traditional arts in the modern day. So you're following a line of teaching that has a direct pathway. And so when you learn the geometry, you learn it in an order mm -hmm. and everything, th there's a whole framework it's, and you're building upon that. Um, so it's all um, worked out and the teaching, some of the teaching staff have been doing it for years and years and years. Um, so you're getting the benefit of a lot of w accumulated wisdom and experience. Um, so I graduated in 2004 and I went back to working in television because, as you probably know, work, being an artist and making a living from an art, being an artist is quite difficult. The good thing about working in television is that it's freelance, so you can have three months on, three months off, you can choose to take work, you can work in development, you know, you can do short term, so you can, if you manage to work it around your practice, you can fit in things. And so I was offered an exhibition at Cartwright Hall in Bradford in 2005. And it was just an idea at the back of my mind about animating geometry because it just made perfect sense to me. Why, why wouldn't you make these shapes dynamic? It, it, it was, to me, it seemed logical. And I had a good friend um, who was a computer programmer. And we're still good friends now. We've collaborated quite a lot. And I taught him about geometry. He taught me about coding. <laughs> and this is very, I mean, it wasn't complicated code. But it was important to me that we weren't making just an animation in a linear way or an animation even in a traditional sense where you've got cells and you take pictures of them. I wanted to make geometry that was based on code because using code was a logical development from the geometry. It, it, it's a mathematical form in and of itself and it has its own language and it has its rules the same way that geometry has. So I thought those two things definitely work and the other thing is I don't think anyone had done it before I don't think even now I think back in 2005 using code to animate geometry I think I was one of the first to do it 
So it was exciting. So that piece was called the Beauty of Abstraction. And it, again, it was very early. And But what was exciting about using the code and coding, we had to, so the geometric rosette or flower had 10 petals and each petal had, had 108 sections. And then we had a section and a section underneath. So each one we gave a number and then we coded each section and we joined the sections together so that literally it opens out as a flower that's blossoming and then comes back in and crashes back in itself. And what you could do, as soon as you put the effort into coding each shape and as soon as you would put all the numbers and letters in, then just one press of a button, you could change from brown to yellow or you could go from... And, and I thought there was quite... Wow. I mean, it doesn't have to be labour intensive and laborious and slow. It can be fast, but it can also still, it can still be meditative. It can still be contemplative. It can still be beautiful. It can still have all the criteria of the traditional art that I'd been taught at the college. But hey, this is a new way of doing it. And is there a certain palette or are there certain colours that are prescribed or promoted through the, the kind of spirit, spiritual art path? Well, I, I, so whenever, the, the thing is, it's, it's, whenever I make or do anything, I always start with the drawing. So I draw it. I have a, an idea in my head what it is that I want to do. So I'll sketch it out of my drawing and I'll draw it again and I'll draw it again. When you're painting, and, and I'm, I'm very grateful for those skills that I have and that were refined at the college. It's, it's, it's slower. It's different. It's a, it's just a different way of working. And now I've worked across a, a lot of different mediums so watercolor by its nature is different to oil painting which is by its nature different to acrylic painting but they all have at their essence you're using color you're using form shadow space you're using all of those things to make something that you think in your mind's eye as an artist you're trying you're controlling it to create something that you think is satisfying and fits in with what it is in your mind that you want to do i think with te digital technology you have the addition of time that's another timeline that gets introduced because you're working in a medium that's linear um, and so you use those same principles of the way you've been taught. So you're still looking at colour, shadow, form, light, dark. Does it work? And, you know, even though at the beginning stage of the technology it's fast, it, it can be fast to put it all in and then you can press a button. It goes, bloop, 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 bloop. The whole thing's done for you. Whereas drawing it by hand would probably take you 10 hours. But the fact that you've done it by hand and you understand it inside out, enables you then when you're doing it with the technology to still kind of refine and refine and you know I've driven people mad <laughs> do it again no it's not right go do it again I was going to say just... where do the refinements come in is, yeah, is it a very you're, time you're, consuming you're, you're tweaking, away you're tweaking so with with the painting so for example I'm painting this painting or if I'm painting a painting you're, you're doing say a little bit every day so you're doing three hours every day and at the end of three weeks you, you've got a painting that you're happy with or you may not be happy with but you've got a painting with the digital, putting it all together and putting the structure of it together is quite quick. But to get it absolutely what it, you see, how you want it to be, can take time. And, and tweaks and tweaks and tweaks and tweaks and then move it here and then let's move it back here. And, and you know, it, it, and, and it's, it's, diff, it's just different because you're looking at a screen and you're looking at code and you're looking at these little timelines. And I would say... Everybody that I've worked with has been incredibly kind and patient <laughs> and good because they understand that you want it to be right. But, you know, on the animations that I've done, we go to about 12 versions, version 1, version 2, version 3, version 3A, version 3B, until we get something that, we're happy, that I'm happy with. It, it, you know, and, and it can be so subtle. It can be a, such a subtle change. And, and that's where time as well, the timing element of it, adds in a new thing that you have to understand which you don't have in the painting or the sculptural work. And at what point would you say you um, called yourself a digital artist? Um, I think the digital work's been there from the beginning um, and I don't see a distinction between digital and, and I think the source and the material and the ideas of the, the geometry of the grids of the subgrids of the way that I make the work and conceive of the work is starting from the same point so whether that goes into sculptural pieces or painting or digital, it all comes from me. So, and I'm the artist. So I, I don't think that's, for me, I like, I couldn't just do digital work because it's, I, I like the physicality of painting. I like the physicality of paint. I like, I like touching paint. I like 
I enjoy it and it's become part of my also spiritual practice. It's become part of my life that I, I work and I draw and I paint and I do that every day. So um, it, I have to kind of do it because it gives me a sense of centeredness, a sense of peace, doing this, this form, working in this area. But I think digital arts become really accepted. I mean, I've never had any, it's become acceptable now. I mean, in the early days, back in 2005, there was an element of, we haven't got a computer, we've only got a DVD player. Can you put it on a DVD? No, because the frame rate on a DVD is different. And you end up explaining these long conversations with curators saying, look, there's a reason why we can't convert this flash animation onto a DVD. And they're kind of right understanding that. But in terms of the reception to the idea of digital, I don't think there's ever been any negativity around that at all. Um, people are quite excited by it. It's just sometimes they don't have the equipment or they don't have the facilities, you know, to be able to do what they want. And, and a lot of art galleries in this country are quite old municipal buildings. So it can't, it's not necessarily, it's not easy for them to convert or to have, you know, visual, uh, you know, motion, time-based work or... One of the oldest ones must be in Birmingham, though, where you had your solo sculpture show. Yes. I suppose the fact that it was sculpture helped yes. them. Yes, I don't think they would have been interested in digital. Um, but that, that, that show, the symmetry and sculpture, came from the work in digital. And so I was working with somebody who's really, really interested in 3D, um, 3D printing. And he bought a machine and he showed me his machine. He said, this is 3D printing. And this is what you can do with it. And it just got me thinking. So I started making these um, out of paper. And I thought, hang on, this is something really, really interesting that could evolve. Because I've done a little bit of casting, but with, with casting and making shapes, particularly ge geometric shapes that fit in grids and subgrids, there's no room for error. There's no room for, you couldn't carve this out of a piece of wood accurately. It'd be very difficult. So that inspired me thinking, hang on, digital printing is really and he said it's a natural 100% fit. percent accurate. Yeah. Is it really? Wow, hundred percent. And then See, that looks like a section of one of the sculptures you did. Yeah, that is. That is. This, these are these are the sample pieces. These are what I made first, actually. And so I had, and then I started researching it and started looking into it. And there was a, there's a, these are made in the Netherlands, actually. Well, the, the original cast was made. So I got um, it just set me thinking in a different way. And so you know, it, it's just an idea, and you have to develop the idea to see what will come. So we. I had them digitally 3D printed and they were perfect. And then we made the casts from them and then we made more casts. And what we found was that they're, that we've got 0 0.2 millimeter um, inaccuracy, which I think is quite good. So without that technology, with the digital 3D printing, you couldn't have made those sculptural forms and those sculptural pieces. So it's sometimes one thing leads to another. But if you look at that exhibition and you look at those pieces, it's quite, in some ways, traditional, it's traditional sculpture but it's come from a technological advance that wouldn't have been made it wouldn't it wouldn't have been possible yeah. without that that was again a, a jump from what i'd been doing before to do something completely different but i like doing that i like trying <laughs> new things and, and seeing what will work and what will happen and i don't feel um constrained to any one material if, if i find something interesting or exciting i'll go and explore it from that show in 2014, there seems to be a lovely sort of momentum building in terms of your yeah. work and the opportunities you're getting with commissions from Sotheby's and Sharjah. Um, and then the Barbican, you seem to have developed a really nice relationship with the Barbican. Can you tell us a bit about that leading to um, Numina? Yes, yeah, so um, well, I live in Walthamstow and there was something called the Walthamstow Garden Party and the Barbican was programming that. And one of my friends who works for an art kind of agency who do, do events, they wanted to have, um, at the end of the garden party, at the end of, you know, the festival, the music, all of that, they wanted something to signify the end. And they didn't want fireworks. They didn't want, you know, because they weren't even cliche. They wanted something artistic. And um, she knew that I'd been working on, we've known each other for a long time. She knew that I made animations and I'd worked on animations. So she phoned me up and said, Zara, do you want to do something big, scale, on a building? Yeah. <laughs> and she said, will you design an animation? So the first year I did it, I did it for free, just for fun, just to see. And it was a collaboration between her organisation and the Guildhall School and the Garden Party and the Barbican. And we were just saying, let's see if this happens. Let's, let's try it. And, so, and they had the equipment. And they, they're in the same building as the Barbican. 
So um, they brought out their equipment and then we projected on the back of the William Morris Gallery. And everyone really liked it and it worked. And, we, and then the next year when they did it again, they said, let's do it properly this time. Let's put some money into it. Why don't you design a new animation? Um, and, and there was a nice um, synchronicity between that and William Morris. Yes. The work of William Morris is pattern based. There's a lot of influence from Islamic art. I mean, he procured the Ardeville carpet for the v and When you look at the work, you can see there's this sensitivity to Islamic carpets and fabric design and things like that. So obviously the, the, the title for me had to be Magic Carpet because of William Morris and, and it was on the back of the William Morris Art Gallery. So that happened. And then um, I was having a con and, and a lot of things happened from conversations. And I, I love talking to people who are working at the the, the very front of their technology or that you know who are interested in the next thing or what's going to happen and him and I had a conversation and I was working on the symmetry and sculpture work and I just and, and he says oh do you know we talked about projection mapping I said what's projection mapping he said oh you can do this and you can do this and because I showed him my work and he said do you know those shapes that you work with perhaps you could do something and that sets off ideas and thinking and yeah. thinking and then we had this really just great coffee in the park and we just had a conversation and then a year later he, he'd had that conversation with somebody else at the Barbican and then she got in touch with me and she said um you know I'd been speaking to Dan and he said that you're quite interested in projection mapping and then now we've got this relationship with Christy who are sponsor these uh, projectors in our foyer why don't you come in and have a chat <laughs> and it was you know and I could see I could, the, the idea for Numina and once I'd understood what projection mapping was and how you could do it, again, just think, I thought, well, that, that would work. Those two things would mesh together really well. Um, so what are the fundamental components that go into Numina? So, yeah, it's, it's basically... It's quite a large piece, isn't it? it it's, it's about five metres by five metres, so it's quite big. It was installed in the lobby of the Barbican, the yeah. foyer. Yeah, the, the foyer projects were something that they wanted to do, because lots of people go to the Barbican for lots of different reasons. So some people just come in to have lunch. Some people go to theatre, some people go and listen to a concert or the art gallery. And because it's got such a big foyer space that people walk through, they wanted to have experiences that people could have without having to go into a, a music. Even if you're just walking through the Barbican, you would have the opportunity to, to see or experience art and music. So that was the idea behind the foyers. And I was the first commission, I think, for that project. And um, yeah, it was very exciting. It was, it's, it's always weird being the first one because they haven't quite developed the programme yet and they don't know how it's going to go. And you couldn't control the lighting, the lighting we of the set. We couldn't control the lighting. Well, yeah. there's one... Which for a project, projected sort of work yeah. is difficult, The isn't good it? thing about the Barbican is it's a very dull building. It's, it's not well lit. Um, it's deep in the interior. Yeah, it's it? deep in the interior. And um, they, part of the commission was that the projectors were being provided by a company called Christie. And they make the best projectors in the world. They make, you know, really big, huge cameras, uh, projectors for cinemas and outdoor displays. So they loaned to the Barbican these really expensive, big 13.5K lumen projectors. So, you know, if you've, someone's offering this to you on a plate, this technology, and I remember talking to the guy from Christie and I was saying, will it be bright in daylight right now? And he said, these projectors are amazing, Zara. Wait, when we switch them on and you will see how powerful they are and how, you know, even in daylight, they, they will still have an impact in that space. And I kind of didn't believe him, but I thought, okay, let's go with this. And again, when they switched it on and it was on in the Barbican space, even at 12 o'clock in the day on a bright day, it's still, the projectors were so powerful on the shapes, you could still see everything completely distinctly. Um, so that was quite, quite an exciting, uh, quite an exciting project. And, you know, developing that, it took about nine months of, of work and it was a collaboration with the Guildhall School and it was working... For the music component? Not, it was two, I was working with two departments. So I was working with uh, the electronic music department which is led by, by Professor Mike Roberts. And so the music that was made for Numina, um, I went in and did a tutorial with the, the students and I showed them how the geometry was designed with my compass and how the, the numbers and 12, 4 and 3 and how and they said that's similar way that we design music as well. So they used those same principles to make the music. But then I was also working with, at the Guildhall School, they have a department for um, projection mapping and digital. And they're training young people to work in theatres and to work in kind of, you know, um, production. And so they, and those students were great. And I'm still friends 
with those students, still meet up with them, because they're young and they're really excited about technology and they really know the forefront of what technology there is and what's being developed and what you can do and the limits of what you can do. So it's exciting talking to them. So I learned from them, they learned from me. It was, it was really, really good. And, um, so how many layers of technology in the end went into Numina? Because it looked a lot. very complex work. It's very meditative and yeah, trance-like. Um, so the actual shapes were designed and made and fitted together by a carpenter and they were you know made by a different company there was music which was made by a professor Mike Roberts and his students and then there was the actual animation and the geometric design and I designed that so I designed that all uh, there's a drawing upstairs you know of, of that and and I we translated that and then again it took it took a while I would say from we started doing that so the, the Numina opened in October around the October the 16th so we started in June July and we worked all the way through to get that right, the animation aspect of it, because it had to be right, and the colours had to be right, and um, I wanted to use the whole RGB spectrum, um, and I like the RGB spectrum because it has no black, it has no white. Um, we did put white in separately afterwards, but you can the way it works and, it, and the way you can control the colours, I'm quite familiar with. So it was, yeah, it was really, really good. And what sort of feedback were you getting from Look, the people who saw it? I've never had so much feedback in my life. I guess it's the bar, you know. <laughs> I've never shown in anywhere as, as big. Or as and it was there for three months, wasn't it? It was there from October to the end of January, yeah, about four months. Um, I got emails from lots of people, lots and lots of people. Lots of them were really nice, really lovely. Um, I've got emails from people saying, I don't like art, I like this. I've got emails from musicians who were performing at the Barbican, and some, some quite well-known musicians, which I won't name, but, and that was quite nice. It was quite nice and it was really nice to walk past it and to, to see it before their performance. And then it won the People's Choice yeah. Award at the Lumen Awards. Was yeah. that a significant kind of benchmark for you? Do you Re think? Really nice, really lovely. I mean, Carla, the organiser of the awards, said they got more votes for Lumen than they've ever had in the history of the People's Choice. So it's like, wow, that's amazing. <laughs> that is, I think it did, I think it touched the nerve. I think people, um, you know, I think for you to kind of go on a computer and log in and vote for something, you have to really like it, you have to really want it to win. So to have that kind of feedback, I guess, from the people who have experienced and seen it, it's, it's really um, kind of um, makes you do what you do, I guess. And it, it's nice that so many people enjoyed it and it had that kind of response to it. I mean, my, my worry sometimes is, you know, I'm, I'm a Muslim, I'm a Muslim woman and there's so much negativity at the moment, you know, in the press and in the world about what's going on. So when you're doing something that is coming from the Islamic tradition, and, and, and I'm not hiding that, I'm saying this is, this is what it is. I, I didn't get one negative or horrible email at all. And I was expecting that there may be. And so that was kind of refreshing. It makes you realise people are a lot more tolerant and open to ideas and open to kind of new experiences than, than you perhaps think. So that's quite, quite nice. I suppose, yeah, that's that's an important kind of element of your work is the, is the spiritual element. And I was thinking in preparing my questions for you, how how well do different spiritual notions um, translate across cultures? Is that an issue uh, mm. when you're making your work, when you're thinking about how it's going to be received, what people will take from it? Or does it just come from you and you assume that if people are open to it, they'll pick it up? I think, um, so I come from, I'm not, you know, I'm not, high, I'm from the Muslim faith tradition. I'm practicing Muslim. Um, so I do believe in, you know, I believe in God and I pray and I have my own, um, you know, belief system and, and practice that, that I do as a Muslim. But I don't think the, my work is necessarily restricted to people of that worldview or faith or people of no faith. And some of the things that I'm interested in are, you know, some of the grids and the subgrids, for example, you know, this grid here, you know, the two equilateral triangles and a grid of those, they are shapes and things that, it, grids that exist in nature. I mean, graphene is based on, it's just hexagons. And, you know, water molecules, when they freeze, they also form hexagons. Diamonds under the microscope look like these rhomboid shapes. So there's a universality in mathematics and, you know, the Fibonacci spiral, you know, the Fibonacci numbers that we have, they're, they are universal ideas and concepts, 
going all the way back to Plato. So there's no no culture or no religion has any There's nothing monopoly. exclusive Not about at the, all. the foundations you know, of what you do. No, so the, the, the ultimate foundation, and I think the inspiration for the original Islamic geometers was nature and was flowers and, and the way that things form. And pattern as an idea, as a concept, is quite interesting. You know, there's patterns in everything. There's patterns in your day. There's patterns in the kids that go to school every day and get picked up. And you can have patterns in almost anything. And I think people relate to that as, as an idea because human beings, we make, we're meaning-making machines. We make meaning out of everything. And one of the ways that we understand the world and how we live is by ordering it. And for some people, they don't like the order at all. They really, I want chaos, I don't like it. But we understand it at a primordial level. I think we do understand what... The, and, and exists within us. So I, I don't think it's that, it's just, it's, you know, I think the, the traditional Muslim mathematicians and artists that evolved this geometric um, system of design were coming from, you know, the Greek exploration of math and then they expanded it and they refined it and they moved it further and they used it in surface design. Um, and, and, that's, and they knew again that it was universal. Um, and what I'm doing is an extension of that, but it's not restricted to any kind of culture or language or form or people. And I think, um, you know, if somebody goes to the Taj Mahal or if they go to the Alhambra and they experience the feeling of being in that space, that's, that's like anybody, you know, there's no, there's no um, restriction on that at all. It can be for whether you believe in God or not. It's, for me, I do, and that's the source, the material, the beginning point from where I come, but that doesn't, have to be you don't have to have that at all it doesn't have to yeah. impact on the pleasure of people taking no from it. no and i think s spirituality is it, it, i think as a word it's become loaded and difficult and people think oh spirituality means all oh, about god and something over there and that's some, you know, something untouchable and i don't think that at all i think spirituality is about connection but what i'm trying to do in my work is to try and connect as much as i can and and you know, the, the spirituality side of it, it, it just, it's a side effect of who I am. And my work is an extension of what I am. So I believe in this and I believe in this way of being and this way of life. And that has to kind of come through. But it's, it's you don't have to subscribe to it at all. Does that make sense, you know? Yes, yeah, yeah. absolutely. Thank you.